All right, there we go. There we go. There we go. You know, it's funny, as we're starting the year off with a series on how to win at life, guess what that was not? That was not winning at life. So it's good to see you guys here this morning. Patrick in the back, our audio guy, I just want to apologize for probably sending you down a tailspin um, of a panic this morning. It's good to see my, my friends up here on the front row. Um, man, I'm happy to be here. I took two weeks off. I took a vacation. I know a lot of people were excited that I was able to do that. We took a bit of a staycation at home, so I did lots of swimming in the pool and going to the gym. I took a nap every day, so that was, that was really good. And I thought, what's it going to be like to come back to church? Am I going to dread that? No, actually, I'm so happy to be here. I, <laughs> I, I got Gail. <laughs> uh, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited. Christmas Day was amazing. We had over 300 people here. We had 300 chairs out, probably 320 people here in the building. Um, absolutely unreal, absolutely incredible. Uh, it really just gave me this picture that, man, there's so much more for this church. And um, so we've got this quarter to kind of come around and, and be with each other. And I'm really hoping next quarter we can open up a second service. And because if Jesus is this good, and if it's this good for us, then we want that for more people. So let's make space for more people. But anyway, I want to get into what we're talking about today. I wanted to start the year off with, with a way, you know, we always want to start the year off with a New Year's resolution, like this year's going to be the year I go to the gym, or I lose weight, or I stop this habit, or I do, you know, it's, we make our New Year's resolutions. I'm not a big fan of New Year's resolutions. I'm more of a themes guy. I like to kind of think about, okay, what is my theme for this year that, that I want to do. And, and one of the things as I was praying about this church was I thought, man, this is kind of a good you know, way to ease people into the year, is, is, that, is that we would look at a beginner's guide to winning at life. Because we all want to win at life. We all want some kind of, uh, we want to feel like that, that, that we're winning. So I can tell you, I can give you an example. Um, or actually, I'll ask you, who, who in your relationship would say, is, is there a competitive winning person in your relationship? And then is there a passive, a very passive person in the relationship? Yeah, no, that was good. Yeah, I, my, my wife is not competitive at all in any way, sense, or form. I'm competitive to a point that I have to turn it off or turn it back on, because if I turn it off with the wrong person or in the wrong kind of setting, then it, people cry, so it's not great. But some people really love to win, and some people aren't as, you know, interested in it when it comes to, like, board games and things like that. But what's it look like to win at life? You know, is it, I, I use clicks as an example all the time, um, but is it like if you go to clicks and you get there before all the senior citizens get there and there's no queue in the line and you can just walk right up and get your medication, like, that feels like you're winning at life. Um, I'll give you another specific example for winning at life one time. This has to do with traffic. Uh, Leafa and I were driving somewhere, we were going through Rondebosch, and I thought, yeah, I'm not waiting and behind all these cars at this robot, I'm going to just go in the other lane and then cut in front of all of them, and, and Leafa's like, well, you know, but if you knew the robot I was talking about, the one by Rondebosch Common, you'd say, no, it's fine, I understand why you did that, because you can sit there for forever, and it just so happened the person that I was going to cut off ended up being Tim, Sam's... Uh, Sam's husband. So I looked over my shoulder and I saw Tim sitting in there. I thought, I'm winning at life. This is an absolute win. I, I don't have to cut off a stranger. I can cut off my, Tim, my friend. I was like, hey, you let me in. He's like, yeah, come, come on in, you know. There was also a time in my life where I was driving a, a Subaru when I lived in the States. And it, it was sort of, it, it, one morning, it, I had to put in a battery in it and then it wouldn't start and it broke. And I just I laid my hands on the dashboard and I just prayed, God, please, when I turn the key, let this car come on and the check engine light be off. And sure enough, I turned the key and the, the car came on and no check engine light. And I just thought, man, that feeling of winning at life is just such a great feeling. Now, I'll give you an example also because we have a lot of times where we kind of feel like we, we aren't winning at life. Um, my wife wasn't here. I guess she's gone now. But we've got a situation in our house right now where, uh, and it's kind of a serious situation, where every time that we put our nine-month-old in the bathtub and he hits the warm water, he poops in the tub. And so, yeah, that, that's not a win. And this isn't occasionally, 
this is this is pretty much every time that that it, it's it's getting to the point where it's every time. So yesterday I'm I'm in kind of my study and I'm working on this sermon, and I all of a sudden I just hear get him out, get him out, get him out. He's pooped, he's pooped, he's pooped. And there's two kids in there. There's Wyatt's in there. Benjamin's in there. And so it's just stripping kids out of the tub. Benjamin's running naked through the house, and then and then it's I'm just, and then you're just standing there with bleach in one hand and water in the tub with two very good-sized problems to deal with right there. And it's like, this, this is, it doesn't really feel like winning, you know, at life. So you know, there's, there's funny moments in our life where we feel like we're winning or, or where, we, where we're not winning. But, um, you know, the question that I think that, that we should, you know, that I want to ask as we kind of get serious a little bit is, is how do you really know if you're winning at life? So what, what is it that, that tells you whether or not you're winning at life? Is, is, it, is it this, um, you know, like, like when I talk about getting my way into traffic, you know, that it's like that feeling of, of, wow, I pulled one over on the system. Or when you talk about maybe, you know, your finances, your relationships, or, or something happens, but the, the things that happen in life that make you just feel like, well, I didn't expect that, and wow, I really, this, this feels like I'm winning at life right here, all these kind of events um, come down to this truth or this reality that winning at life for us is so much associated with feelings. So when we feel good, we feel like we're winning at life. When we feel bad, it feels like we're not winning at life. So we feel good in our relationships, we're winning. When we feel good about our day, it feels like we're winning in life. When we feel bad, it feels like we're not winning in life. See, what we want as people, see, this is our pursuit. This is everyone in the room. This is kind of like mankind. This is humanity, is that we want to feel like we're winning. See, that this feeling is actually what is the most important thing to us. Do we want to feel like we're winning? So if you sit there and examine your life, I want to invite you to examine your life right now. Examine your finances, examine your home life, your relationships, examine um, just, just how you felt this morning when you woke up. What problems are there in your marriage or what problems are there at your work? What, what, what stresses are you up against? What problems do you have maybe with your neighbors or with your vehicles or your shortcomings or, or whatever it is? And I want you to think about the way that those things make you feel. Because if you could change one of those things, you would change it in a way that makes you feel better. See, so much of, of, of us winning at life is based on that we feel like we're winning at life. Now, this idea of winning at life can, absolutely, can, can actually be substituted. So there's winning at life is a feeling. But we can also insert the word in there like we want to feel like we're winning, but we want to feel happy. So in our relationships, we want to feel good. We want to feel happy. I mean, who, who wants to wake up and feel horrible? Who wants to wake up and feel just down and depressed? None of us do. We want to wake up. We want to feel happy. But who actually can do that? I don't know whose head pops off the pillow and just is like, I'm happy today. Today's amazing. You know, maybe, maybe Benjamin, our three-year-old, 60% of the time, good day, great day. The other 40% of the time, we're just hiding from him. <laughs> but we want, we want to feel happy. If I feel happy, I'm winning at life. Now, this is really hard for people that struggle with like maybe a, a mental illness or, or like something like depression or anxiety. And if that's you, that's okay. That's me too. And guess what? That's 80% of the people in this room. They're just all too afraid to admit it. But we can admit it. We can be open about it. And if this is you, it's really hard to feel happy. But winning at life is not connected to you feeling happy. And that, that's what we're going to unpack today. So you could also substitute happy with, with the word content. You know, we want to feel content. What would it take for you to feel content? How much money do you need to make? What kind of relationships do you need to have? Do you need to be married? Do you need to have that child and, and get pregnant? What is, what is it in your life that's keeping you from feeling content. You know, another word that we could substitute for winning is in control. Who here loves to be just out of control of your life and let everyone else just dictate and control everything 
that you you know that you're up against and you did no it's horrible no one no one really wants to be out of control we want to be in control of our life i want to feel in control i want to feel like i have some way to influence what happens to me and what doesn't happen to me i want to feel like i'm not at the whim or at the mercy of other people i don't know if this resonates with anyone but i'm speaking just for me these are things that i feel These are things that I think and that I worry about. You know, the the last one that I would substitute for for winning is is this word love. You know, man, if if there isn't a word that's more attached, you know, to feelings than than loved. You know, being loved, feeling loved. You know, when you're dating and you you send out that, or, you know, I'm going to outdate myself. I don't know if people still swipe right. Swipe left, swipe right. The younger Carla, the younger generation, the younger than me would know that. But this, this, this idea of, okay, I've, I've put it out there. See, for me in college, it was Facebook. That was still when Facebook was only for colleges. I don't know if you guys remember that or if you know that. But when Facebook first, first rolled out, you could only... Uh, get it if you were in a, a college or university. And so it rolled out to, to the University of Tennessee. And then uh, later, later, later in life, it became something that all you old people in the room are now on. <laughs> and so all of us have left, you know, no, but, but yeah, so I, I remember it was just for universities. And when I would send a message to a girl or something, and then she would, you know, respond, it would be like, man, I feel, this feels awesome. This is working. Something's going to come out of this. You know, that, that's just in dating, but in our marriage, in our relationship, we want to feel love. That's how we feel like we're winning. That's how, that's how we feel like we're winning at life, is when these things like in control and being content and being happy and being loved, when those things are working for us and with us, it's like, oh, my life is winning. So the, the question that I would ask because, see, this drives, like, so much of what we do. This desire to feel like we're winning. It drives everything. From the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, probably subconsciously more than you know, this drives so much about you. But why is it that, that we feel like we have such a huge desire to feel like we're winning? Why do we have such a deep desire to feel like we're winning? What, what, what is that in us that, that creates that desire, that drives people to do things that they never thought that they would do to feel like they're winning at life? See, there's something deep in you that drives those desires. Now, I can tell you, as the, the pastor standing here on stage, that everyone has in their heart a God-shaped hole, and what happens is, is we try and put other things in the God-shaped hole and it always leaves us unfulfilled. But I, I don't want to, that is the truth, is that we were all created to need God, and only He can fulfill us in the way that we want to be, and we need to be fulfilled. But I want to unpack it more for you. I don't want to just tell you that and then leave you with that. But, but you were created. We have a deep desire to feel like we're winning, to feel loved, to feel happy, to feel like life is going to be okay, and that life is good. So, now I want to talk about the difference between, like, um, one and winning. So, feelings aside, so if we take our feelings and we put them aside, how do we know when we have won at life? So, how would we know when we've won at life? See, this is something that, that I would say that I really have dealt with on my journey with anxiety and depression, is you often find yourself thinking, but when is it going to be over? When will the day come that I will no longer deal with anxiety or stress or depression? Because the day that I no longer deal with these things, that's the day that I've won. See, when you win, it, it, it kind of tells you that it's over. When I win at a game, the game is over. When, when I can say that I have won this issue, then the issue is over. When I have won at life, life is over. But that's not the way that it works. See, we, we don't want to chase this idea that I have won at life. Because, see, there is no won at life. There is only winning. Because what winning means is that this is an ongoing, 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 ongoing thing. 
See, I want us to understand and wrap our head around this, that, that no one's going to wake up and say, I'm done. I've solved all my problems. All the problems are taken care of. Everything is right in life. The kids are wonderful. Finances are good. Everything is squared and ready to go. I've won. It's over. No one's going to ever wake up and feel that or be able to say that. And if you do, it may last a day, two days, but something's going to knock you off that horse. See, there's only winning. And what I mean by that is that it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. Our entire life is this pursuit towards winning, the feeling of winning. So what I want to do over this series is I want to give us three things that we can do. That's one thing each week for the next three weeks. And these three things are things that I I really hope are going to help you kind of act as like a beginner's guide to feeling like you're winning at life. See, I want to give you something to start the year off with that I know is going to help you, that I know is going to set you up well for the rest of the year. And so today we look at step one. Step one, and this is simple here, none of this is rocket science. Step one that we're going to do is we're going to build a solid foundation. So everything starts with a foundation. And where we're going to start with this is, is very practical. All right? this, is, this is not a deep theological thing, but we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Sermon on the Mount, this is when Jesus was giving one of his famous sermons. I think he gave two or three of them. And Jesus is, is up on this mountain. He's given almost like a manifesto. So that he's just been telling people, this is how I want you to live your life. This is how I want you to treat each other. This is how I want you to love each other. This is how I want you to operate if you are a follower of Christ. So Jesus has just laid this whole thing out to people. He's told people everything that they need to know to be a Christ follower. He's told them everything they need to know to live in the freedom of what comes as a Christ follower. So I want this, your takeaway for this is this moment where we jump into Scripture. Jesus has just downloaded for people everything that they need to know to follow him and to live their life in a way that reflects that. So after he's given them all this information, after he's told them everything that that he could tell them, he ends this story with the parable. And I think Jesus is so smart about this because, I mean, we we do the same thing. So if we we look in Matthew 7 here, this is where Jesus jumps into this parable about these two builders. Now, I think that that this, is, that this is pretty interesting to me, is that, is that Jesus is saying, so everyone who hears these words, so basically what he's saying is, I've just told you a bunch of stuff. Now, how many of you have heard it and listened to it? We do this with our kids. You know, I, I give instructions to Benjamin or to Lifa or even to, to why am I, like, hey, this is what I need you to do. This is how you're going to do it. And then I'll say, now you tell me what, what it is that dad just asked you to do. And it's, you know... It's, cra- it's never kind of in line. It's all over the place. Actually, Leaf is really good about it. He's actually great at it. But Benjamin, you never know what you're going to get. You never know. And so, like, like I work with, with my child, with my three-year-old, almost four-year-old, Jesus is working with his followers, who for him are young. They're immature in their faith. And so he's just told them everything they need to know. And then now what Jesus is saying is he's saying, okay, so if you heard me, then here's what you're going to do. And if you didn't hear me or you choose not to apply it, here's what's going to happen to you. So that's the context of where we are in this story. And so we look at this parable that Jesus tells. And it it, it, uh, includes two people and they're two builders. And they do everything exactly the same except for one thing. There's one thing that's different between these two people that separates their process. So we're going to look at it. He says, so everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them. So Jesus is like, hey, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And are you going to do what I said? So if you heard me and you do what I said, so that's why this comes at the end of Jesus' sermon. So he's saying, did you hear me? Are you going to do what I said? So he says, if you do that, you'll be like a wise man. So that's far-sighted, being able to see in the future, not just what's here right in front of me right now, today, but actually being able to look ahead, practical, and a sensible man. 
See, we all want to be practical. We all want to be sensible. Who built his house on the rock. So Jesus is saying, if you hear me and you do what I say, it's like you're building your house on a solid rock. Now, many of us know this story. Now, we, we look in verse 25. Jesus says, if you build your house on this solid rock. He says, and the rain fell. So I think about like the rain coming from the top. And the floods and torrents came. So the floods come up from the bottom. And the wind blew and slammed against the house. Coming, I imagine it coming from the side. So I think about this house being completely engulfed in a natural disaster. From the top, from the bottom, and from the sides. It's getting pressure from all of those different areas. And so he says, And the rain fell, and the floods and torrents came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So Jesus is saying to, the, to these people, If you hear me, and if you do what I say, then it's like you're building your house on a solid rock. When the storms come, that house will stand. So then Jesus goes to say, Okay, for those of you that aren't listening, for those of you that didn't hear me, Here's what happens with you. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, they will be like a foolish or stupid. I mean, the Bible actually says that. It's kind of harsh language. But, it's, I mean, that's what Jesus means here. Be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. See, th- this, is, this is this foolish idea. You could build on a rock. Instead, this guy builds on sand. So what happens if you build on sand? Well, guess what? When the rain fell and the floods and torrents came and the winds blew and slammed against the house, same storm, same storm happens to this house. It fell, it, and it fell, and great and complete was its fall. So you have one house that withstood the storm, and then one house that doesn't withstand the storm. So that, as I was reading that, I thought, okay, that's pretty simple. That's a simple concept for us. We could all say, you know what, let's build our house on a solid rock. Let's build on a good foundation. Hey, everyone, Jesus is your foundation. Build on Jesus. Everyone, go to work. You're going to be fine. Like, you're going to stand up to the wind. You're going to stand up to the torrent. Just build your house on Jesus. Now, we, we could just say that and end the message, but I really just thought, like, wait a minute. But why would anyone build on sand? So even if you're not a smart person and you don't believe in Jesus, why would anyone build on sand? See, in, in these times, in Galilee, in the Sea of Galilee, on a hot day, in the hot season, the top layer of the sand would get really hard. It would almost be hard like concrete. And so people, you know, that maybe they wanted to take a shortcut, maybe they didn't want to spend the money or spend the resources or hire the right people, to build or to dig that foundation down. You know, we all know those people, those builders, especially if you're in construction or architecture or some field, or, or, or maybe, you know, this is, I'm about to describe your uncle or your cousin, you know, where they walk over and, yep, that's good. You can build on that. You know, and then, you know, years later, you know, half your house is sagging, you know, to the side. <clears throat> See, why would anyone build on sand? There's practical reasons, maybe, shortcuts, things like that. But when I thought about us, why would we build our lives on sand? And guess what? I came up with, I feel like God gave me a word for this. The reason that we choose to build our house on sand, it's, it's one word. It's, it's hope. This maybe isn't the word that you were thinking would come here. But we choose to take the shortcut or to build on sand because we, we have hope. Our hope is in something. See, what, 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 what happens when we hope for something? We long for it. See, it's hope that drives us to do things. It's, it's this, this light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, man, I hope, I hope, I hope. And so what, what does a soft foundation in our life look like when you build on sand? See, our soft foundation is what we put our hope in. So what have you put your hope in? Because if your hope is in something other than Jesus, then you're building on sand. See, if I put my hope in my finances, 
You know, I hope that I get a raise. I hope I make enough money. I hope that God provides. If we put our hope in that, is, is there ever enough finances? There are always going to be more things in your life that break down than money that you can make to fix or maintain or replace those. But when we put our hope in finances, it just takes one disaster for that, that, sand, that house on sand to crumble. When we put our hope in relationships, it just takes one bad argument for that foundation to crumble. When we put our hope in our careers, it just takes one boss to choose somebody else other than you to promote. For us to feel like we've lost our purpose, and then the house that we've built, it crumbles because it turns out it was built on sand. Health and emotions. When we put our hope on on, on, on our health, our physical health, or we put our hope on our emotional state or on the emotional state of others, we are building our house on sand. See, if your hope is in anything other than Jesus, you're building your house on sand. And see, that's something that when I thought of that, that kind of just blew my mind. And I thought, oh, my, my word. There's parts of my house that are built on sand. Some of my house has got a solid foundation under it, and some of it has sand underneath it. Because my hope's not in Jesus. But see, the, the truth that we need to accept, the truth for us, is that the strength of your foundation is going to determine your future. So the, the strength of our foundation is always going to determine our future. See, our, our, our strong foundation determines that when the storms come, our house stands. Our weak foundation determines that when the storm comes, our house falls. Because we put our hope in something other than Jesus. So now, as I talk about putting our hope in Jesus, for those of you that, that aren't a Christ follower, or those of you that are new to church, you know, I don't want to take for granted that, that you would just do what I say. Like, hey, Jesus is the answer. You can put your hope in Jesus. Because you, you may not believe that. Maybe you need some evidence, then that's okay. So you don't have to just believe everything that I say. Everything can actually be tested. You could test every single word that comes out of my mouth. Pick up a Bible, go and call somebody and test it. So I, I wanted to give you a reason as to why you can trust Jesus. So why do we know that we can trust Jesus? How do you know that we can trust Jesus? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you. See, Jesus... First of all, and most importantly, he gave his life for you. So that's why we can put our hope in, in Jesus, is because he gave, he died. He gave his life for you. See, Jesus came, he left his heavenly seat, and he came down here on earth, and he walked around for 33 years in, in a body like ours, and he took on a beating, he was nailed to a cross. He gave his life for you. That's worthy of putting your hope in. Now see, the other thing that makes Jesus trustworthy, that makes Jesus great, is Jesus is unchanging. See, your finances, your relationships, your, uh, your emotions, all those things can change. Your career can change. Your, your, your relationship with your spouse, all of that stuff can change. Everything can change. Tomorrow morning you can wake up and everything can be different and everything can change. We're one step away from anything in our life changing. But guess what never changes? It's Jesus. Jesus is steady. He never changes. His promises never change. That whole thing where I talked about Jesus coming and dying for us, that's the continuation of a promise that God made when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. See, God pursued mankind after, after we sinned and we were thrown out of the garden. God never stopped pursuing us. God made promises to Moses and to Abraham and to David. And God made all these promises. And he, he stayed true to that. He sent Jesus. Jesus died for our sins so that we could have relationship with God. And that truth never, ever, ever, ever changes. Now, I'll show you in Scripture this here. So let's, let's look at a verse here in Hebrews 10, 23. I've got a couple verses. Let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope without wavering. So it's saying, let us continue to hope in God without, wait, without change. Let us just not stop hoping in God. Because he who promised, that's Jesus, is reliable and trustworthy and faithful to his word. 
So Jesus doesn't change. What you put your hope in determines your foundation. What your foundation is built on determines how you weather the storms of life. I've got another verse for you here. It's also in Hebrews. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is eternally changeless always. I love that. That's three words that kind of mean the same thing. Eternally, forever, changeless, doesn't change, always. Oh, it's like eternally, always changeless. The same yesterday, today, and forever. See, how great is that? That's why we can trust Jesus. See, when you build your life on Jesus, it doesn't mean that, that you'll never have a storm that comes. Building your life on Jesus doesn't mean that there aren't storms in your life. Building your life on Jesus doesn't mean that you live in this little cove that's protected from the wind and the waves and the rain and all of that stuff. See, building your life on Jesus, it means that instead you have the confidence and the peace to get through any storm. See, if we're talking about winning at life, I think that one of the greatest ways that we can win at life is to walk into any storm any torrential downpour, any flood from above, any wind from the sides, and have confidence and peace because our hope is in Jesus. That to me is a win. My desire is not to have a life without problems. My desire is to always feel at peace because of my confidence and my trust in God. So there's this beautiful verse in Isaiah that talks about peace because peace Peace is so important to us. We crave peace. You know, p- peace comes from, it, it, a lot of times we put our hope in things that are, are going to bring us peace. Man, if I put my hope in our finances and our finances grow, I'm going to have peace in my life because I'm going to be able to pay the bills. No, nope, your finances can change. Guess what doesn't change? Jesus doesn't change. And Isaiah, he's, he's, Isaiah is talking about Jesus. He's foretelling. And he says, you, so this is you, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. See, if we keep our mind on Jesus, we're kept in perfect peace. And when we, because we're in perfect peace, it's because we trust in him. See, I want you to know that Jesus is trustworthy. You can put your trust in Jesus. So, to kind of finish this off, you know, I, I, I wanted you to know how much God loves you. I wanted you to know how much Jesus is for you. And I wanted you to know that, that you can't live a life that doesn't encounter storms and things like that. But what happens when you encounter these storms is those storms, they begin to expose these cracks that are in your foundation. Remember, let's be honest here. Let's be honest with each other. Part of my foundation is built on solid rock. Some of my foundation is built on sand. And when storms come, because I'm not perfect, these cracks, they form in my foundation. And cracks will form in your foundation. But guess what? I know the builder. I know the mason. I know the guy that made it. I know the guy that made me. See, it's Jesus. The unchanging, always loving, eternally, always and forever, Jesus. When you put your hope in Him, even when cracks are exposed in your foundation, Jesus will help you fix them. See, you can't lose when your hope is in Jesus. You can only win. So I'm going to pray for us and ask the band to come up. And I I just want you to know that... um, Like Sam said earlier, we are a church that's just full of love. We care about you so much. And during this last song, this is an opportunity for you to respond if you want to and if you need to. We've got some prayer partners that come down front and they're there for you to pray. I mean, anything you need prayer for, you can come down and and get prayer with them. We're not going to solve your life. We're not going to fix all your problems. All we're going to do is just pray with you. And if you're not comfortable doing that, then after the service, they'll stay down front and you can do that. But put your hope in Jesus. And so during this last song, as you stand and as you sing, I want you to think about where in your life is your hope in something else? Because when your hope is in something else, you're building on sand.
But don't forget that the eternally, always and forever, unchanging builder is Jesus. And he's there for you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much.